Um, so after spending two years uh, looking after your brother Kevin, you got a job in the city. Yeah, so, so um, I worked in the city for a while. So I, my first job was with a company who provided software to city traders, um, to dealers and analysts and so on. And, so, and um, it, was, it was, as I say, well before the internet, but it was, it was that sort of thing, you know. So, so we were providing um, um, sort of analysis of things like traded options, other, other derivative type products. So, you know, difficult mathematical stuff. And I was, you know, I became the sort of head of, of, of support. So it was my job to travel around the city, going to see different people who were doing different things and helping them to get value out of our software. And that meant that, um, you know, I would be going from desk to desk to different banks in the city and everybody was doing something different. Um, and it was, it was a really difficult job because, you know, I'd have to get my head around what each individual trader was doing um, and what they wanted, and then I worked with them to produce um, um, sort of programs that helped them to do their job. So I had to understand um, the whole um, the whole area that we were operating in, which was very very broad. Um, so although my job was difficult, um, it was I would say pretty special in the sense that it really brought me on. Um, you know, each day would be another challenge. Each day I'd have to be working with a different person doing something different. And so for four years, I just spent going back and forth to different people in different banks, helping them to make money in the, 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 the ways in which they made money. Um, but, it, but all the while learning more and more about how the city worked. And was that learning on the job? I think I'm straight from university. T to totally. Now, I, there was a gap. So I, the, you know, I, my, I had the situation with my brother and then I worked in various kind of like manual labor type jobs, you know, places like B&Q and building sites and all that sort of thing for quite a long time. It wasn't until I was 26 that I had my first serious job, or maybe I was 25, 26, can't remember. But so that was the first proper job I ever had. So I hadn't wasted a lot of time um, and I was a long way behind the curve. So I had friends of mine who'd been sort of five years working, you know, for sort of, you know, accountants, firms and banks and earning, you know, five times as much as me. Um, so I, I had an awful lot of catch up to do and I was realistically never going to catch them up because it's hard to make up those, those sorts of times. But I, I did learn very, very fast um, and it was, you know, it was a good time for me in that sense. And were you still betting seriously in this, at this point? Yes, yeah, so the reason I left that job was because, um, so what actually happened was um, I was making a lot of money in the bookies anyway and then I put on a, one time I went down um, to the, uh, I was going to go down the bookies and I'm chatting to a friend of mine on the phone and um, um, we were talking about um, uh, the Grand National and the, um, uh, the Lincoln, so the spring double. So there was a particular strategy that we were looking at and a particular horse that fitted that strategy. So, so um, essentially I think we, we were looking at horses that were gelded after their th three-year-old year and then coming back as four-year-olds and how they potentially did in their first in their first run back from that and we thought that was an interesting line to follow you know for certain types of horses and there was a horse in the Lincoln that was 40 to 1 and he's called High Low and um, um, he fitted that um, strategy so he, he was uh, trained by by William Haggis and um, um, he was in the Lincoln at 40 to 1. I thought that was a, a rig. I'm chatting to this friend of mine, and, and we, I wanted to back party politics for the national anyway. So I went down the bookies and um, um, put on a... I had £100 in my pocket, and I lost £70 on a national hunt flat race, and then I put the last 20 on um, um, this spring double. Yeah. So it was, it was 40 to 1 and 25 to 1. So it was 1,000 to 1, and there was a bonus for getting the spring double a 20% bonus or something like that. So I put that bet on, in the, you know, stupidly having, you know, I could have put a £50 bet on. I didn't even do it each way. I just did a, a straight win double. Um, but that came in. So that, that was, uh, th was £25,500 uh, for that. And with that, I uh, bought a share in um, a horse with, with John Hills, a trainer. And... Um, he turned out to be a very nice horse, and about 
three months after that, so um, we had, so we spoke to John on the Sunday and he had three horses running on the Monday and they were decent prices. They were like, I think they were 17 to two, 15 to two and no, 13 to two, 15 to two and seven to two or something. And he said he thought they would all win. And so I put a series of Trixies on and singles and what have you all around the various bookmakers, which I frequented at the time. And uh, those three horses came in. So I picked up 30,000 for that. And at the time I was, uh, you know, I was still in my 20s. And this was a long time ago, right? So, you know, I picked up about, um, you know, 50 grand um, in, in a very short time period. And that was way more than I earned each year. So my salary was probably about somewhere between 25 and 30. You know, this is quite a long time ago, right? And I was doing okay anyway. So suddenly I had, you know, a lot of money in the bank and I wasn't earning very much at work and it just, I just didn't want to work anymore. I thought I'm going to make more money betting. So because I gave you, up. you actually went full-time professional gambler for a bit. Well, I did and I didn't because at the same time I was playing semi-professional bridge. So um, I've always been a card player um, and I play a whole lot, all the different card games, but for whatever reason I ended up playing bridge. Um, you know, how and why, I don't know, but that, that, that was the game that most appealed to me. You know, I played poker and, you know, very whist drives and all, all other forms of games, but ended up playing bridge. And there's a bridge club in London where you can play for pretty high stakes and you're winning or losing about, you know, a thousand pounds a day or, or higher if you want to. Um, and I'd started going down there and I'd been there sort of 10 or 11 times and I was making consistent money down there. Um, so, you know, combination of playing bridge for money, which is obviously gambling and betting, um, um, just, just backing horses mostly. So for about a year I did, I did that, the combination of those two. Um, so yes, gambling, but, but, but probably my more dependable income was coming from the bridge table. Okay, so where did um, programming come in? When did you learn that talent? Uh, uh, well, um, I learned a little bit at university. I mean, obviously I did get thrown out, but prior to getting thrown out, I did do okay on the computing module. So I, I didn't, you know, I didn't go to any of my maths lectures, but um, I did pass computing and I passed statistics and probability, which, which, which is probably my main interest. So I am actually a pretty reasonable mathematician, even though I didn't go to any of my lectures. Um, um, so um, I, w I always, had a little bit of computing skill and then and then when I was talking about my job in the city a lot of that was building spreadsheets for people so um, you know it's not real not hardcore code but you're kind of tinkering around with Visual Basic there and you know there's a little bit of coding there and then having so but then after my year of betting and gambling and bridge playing I then um, decided I had to go back to work and the reason I guess Probably the most significant reason was the fact that um, I was going out with a girl who is now my wife, and I think she probably would have left me if I had carried on living the life that I was leading. So, you know, I, I, I don't regret for a moment my, my, my year living as a professional gambler. In fact, it was a wonderful year of my life. But I couldn't live that for my whole life, you know, and I, I know a lot of people do spend their whole lives as professional gamblers and but for me I guess I, I guess I wanted there to be some sort of a product so the idea that I start the day and I've got a certain amount of money in my pocket because it was all cash back then and then I finish the day and there's you know if I've had a good day there's more and if I haven't there's less but that's that's all there ever is is it's just it's just an accrual or you know of, of cash when I used to have cash all around my flat in different places, I used to hide it away when I had a big win, and, you know, forget about it sometimes. Um, uh, but, you know, li living, living this strange life all around cash, you know, I just, it just didn't sort of work for me. It didn't feel like I was building a proper future. And then you're thinking about getting married and, you, you know, you want to have kids and all that sort of thing. Well, it just didn't seem to work. So I thought I've got to be a bit more responsible. So that was... So that caused me to retrain um, as a computer scientist, really. Okay, so that was back in the city, or 
not really. I never went back to the city. So, so after my job um, at the company Track Data, where, the, where I was um, providing uh, data to analysts, I did spend a year working for a hedge fund. I'm struggling to remember when that was. That was somewhere, somewhere in there. Um, but, um, and that was kind of city-ish. And I guess the good thing about the hedge fund was that it, I think that was actually after my year of gambling, I think I spent a year at a hedge fund then, might be getting it wrong. But basically, they were investing in all of the tech startups. So um, I would go, so if Yahoo came to town or eBay came to London on a, doing a road show, I would go and sit in on that. Um, so um, I was getting to see all these, you know, American tech businesses coming to the UK. And in that year, I guess I understood, I just naturally got to understand an awful lot more about what was coming and what was working and what wasn't working. So, and I also got to understand how exchanges work, and that's kind of important. The nature of um, how, a, you know, the types of different types of stock exchanges around the world. So in the UK, typically you have market maker exchanges and you're buying off a market maker. But in the US, you put money, you put shares up there on the board and people take them off. Just as in Betfair, you put money up there at a price and people take that price. So the nature of that type of exchange, um, you know, so I sort of learned more about that in my year at the hedge fund. Um, and then after that, I went programming for all sorts of random people. So where did Ed Ray come into the story? Well, um, after, so having taught myself to program in certain languages and just sharpened my skills up a little bit um, um, around, you know, rel relatively simple languages and, you know, getting into databases and, and, you know, more than spreadsheets, which I was before, um, I worked at various places, including GCHQ. So... Uh, Is that still top secret, what you did there? I did, I don't think I did much there that was really interesting. Um, I mean, it, most, most of what I did was working on their accounting system, so it was actually quite boring. Um, um, I think I did some interesting stuff for the MOD afterwards. So having worked at GCHQ, I carried on working for the Ministry of Defence on a programme that analysed all, um, all of their resources, their worldwide resources. And I know that program was sold to the Pentagon after I left, and I did most of the work on that. And it was very rare that they managed to sell anything to the Pentagon. So, so that was a good piece of work. I was very proud of that. Um, but um, I, I, you know, a lot of that kind of defence type work, I, I, I couldn't, I wouldn't be allowed to discuss it. Um, so I'd rather not say anything there. Um, but anyway, anyway, while I was at GCHQ, um, I had the ideas for Betfair. Um, so. I think I was looking for an idea, and I've had some really bad ideas. Um, I can't even remember what those bad ideas were, but then one day I just sort of pictured in my head, instead of three to one from a bookmaker, I pictured sort of 3.2, 3.3 sort of thing, a, a bit in an offer spread and how it would work and how the money could come up and come off it and so on and so forth. And I thought that was a really amazing idea. And normally when you have an I when I had an idea, I'd go to bed and then I'd wake up in the morning and say, oh my God, what was I thinking yesterday? What a ridiculous idea, you know, I must have been, what was I smoking or, you know, whatever. But on this occasion, I woke up in the next morning and I thought, wow, that actually is, that actually could happen. That does make sense. And then you're just thinking and thinking and thinking and flushing it all out in your head. 